Good morning. <clears throat> I'm going to sit down today because if I, I'm so weak, I might fall down. Um, would you pray for me uh, as I get ready to preach? I probably should have had somebody else preach today, but I'm, um, I really feel so strongly about this message that I wanted to preach it. <laughs> so <laughs> please pray for me. <laughs> Father, we come before you just needy people, and I am especially needy right now. And I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and <clears throat> use me, help me to speak what you have spoken into me this week. And I'm so, so hungry and desirous for others to hear. I thank you for the power of your word. It is life transforming. And I, I so desperately want these people that I love to, to hear your, your word. And so we just, we need you today. We come asking. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we're in this series called Spending Time with Jesus. And um, we've been discovering that those of us who are disciples of Jesus Christ, that is, those of us who are following Jesus, to learn from Jesus, to become like Jesus, we need to, just, we need to spend time with Jesus. And uh, in, the, in the Gospels, we discover that Jesus would get away with his disciples. So if you want to turn your Bible to John chapter 3, verse 22, this is the verse that we've, we're launching this series from. Because um, as we're preaching to the Gospel of John, we just get this, this, this small note that uh, after Jesus was done talking with these people in Jerusalem, he went off into the Judean hills, in the Judean countryside, to, to spend some time with his disciples. And we talked about how cool this was, that the intentionality of Jesus that he cared so much about his disciples, that he wanted so much for them to, to get what he wanted to say to them, that he took them off to this retreat and spent some time with them. And we talked about how that language in the original language means to rub off on him. So Jesus took his disciples away so he would rub off on them. And of course we discovered this is, this is a beautiful picture of what it means for us to be disciples, that we spend time with Jesus so that he rubs off on us and we become more like him. In fact, we said that the only way, remember this? If you've been here throughout this series, the only way to become like Jesus is to spend time with him. And then, then we talked about how it's possible to spend time with Jesus, but not become like him. In fact, I pointed out how maybe you may, you may know somebody who's, who has their quote unquote devotions every day. They, they go to church. They're a churchy type person. But they're no more like Christ than anybody else. So there's a way of spending time with Jesus where you become more like him. And there's a way of spending time with Jesus where you don't become more like him. So I don't know about you, but I want to know the way. I want to know how do I spend time with Jesus so that he rubs off on me and I become more like him. Well, um, probably the, one of the best passages in all of Scripture to picture this, to describe this, um, is, a, is the last night with Jesus and his disciples before he died. I don't know how many of you know this, that, that um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke just give one or two chapters to the last night of Jesus. But John gives John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, five chapters describing the night before Jesus died and the things he said to his disciples. So um, in John 14, um, it ends with Jesus saying, okay, let's leave from here. He's leaving the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm sorry, he's leaving... Um, uh, he's leaving the, the time, the, the upper room that he has with his disciples. 
leaving the Passover meal and is going to the Garden of Gethsemane where he's going to be arrested. This is, this is the last moments. And as he walks out of the upper room, thinking about his death, uh, thinking about there's some things I want to say to these guys. There's some things I want to pass on. He passes this little patch of, of um, field in Jerusalem where there's a vineyard. And, and ringing in Jesus' ears are the questions of his disciples. Because he's been talking about, I'm going away. I'm, I'm going to die. And where I'm going, you can't follow. And as he walks past the vineyard, he, he hears the disciples grumbling and complaining. What are you talking about, Jesus? Where are you going? What's happening? He could hear the fear. He could feel the, the fear rising up because they're wondering, how am I going to do life without Jesus? I've been with him for three years. I've been spending all this time. Now what? What's he talking about? He's leaving. He's going. And so you and me who are disciples who can't see Jesus in the flesh, we're like the disciples who have to figure out how to spend time with Jesus when you can't see him anymore. And so as Jesus walks by this vineyard, he points out to his disciples, see that vineyard? And then he begins to say what is in John 15. So turn with me to John 15, such an amazing chapter. And um, let's stand to our feet and we're gonna read verses four through 12. And uh, I, I'm, I'm going to preach on this, you know, later uh, when I get to John 15. So I'm just going to, you know, go over this real quickly. But there's so much good things in here about how to spend time with Jesus when you can no longer see him. Here we go, John 15, 4. Jesus speaking, remain in me as I also remain in you. Again, walking by the vineyard, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, Jesus says. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you all this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Let's, let's be seated. <clears throat> So here you are the last night, walking by the vineyard, and Jesus says, you want to know how to spend time with me, how to be with me, how to become more like me after I'm gone? It's as simple as staying connected to a vine being connected to, of the branch being connected to the vine. Write this down on your notes and we'll talk about it. We spend time with Jesus by staying connected. And, and uh, this would have made instant sense to the disciples. Even if he hadn't been walking by a vineyard, everywhere you went in Israel, there were all these vineyards. I mean, when I, go, when I take people to Israel, I show these, I show people, they're in the, the hills around, around Jerusalem. They're in, on the, the coast, the Mediterranean coast, there's all these vineyards. You go up to the Galilee region and the Golan Heights and there's all these vineyards. You can even go into the, the, the wilderness and now Israel is so good at irrigation, now they're growing vineyards in, like on the edge of the desert. Everywhere you go in Israel, there's vineyards. And even when you don't see a vineyard, you see wild grapevines. I mean, it's, they've always been this way. Those of you who know your Old Testament, remember Remember when, when uh, Joshua sent the spies to 
scout out the land and they, they were looking around in Israel and they said, they brought back these, these uh, grapes and these clusters and they had, <laughs> they had to carry them, the, the cluster, on a rod balanced between two guys' shoulders. That's how big the clusters were. These massive grapes, well, they're not this big, but you know, they're, they're, they're the size of a plum. They're just absolutely huge. Um, and I can imagine the disciples probably grew up throwing grapes at each other, playing in the vineyard. What a great place to, to have a fight, to have a war. Instead of snowballs, it's grapes. Of course, when you've had a grape fight, your mom can tell because it's all over you, you know. But you know, they probably played in the vineyards and they, they knew the vineyards. They, they understood this metaphor instantly. And when Jesus said, if you remain in me, stay connected to me, plugged into me, you'll bear much fruit. Bam! No explanation needed. They pictured, they saw the the big grapes and the fruit, and they thought, yeah, I I understand that. So when when I take people to Israel, in fact, I'm going this fall, I I want to, I want to, what I'll do is we'll stand in the in the middle of a vineyard, and I'll do a teaching from John 15. In fact, let, let me just take a commercial for a second because we have a, a meeting coming up next Sunday night that I want to invite you to, and it's a really important meeting. If, if you want to go to Israel, then you've got to come to this meeting. And um, years ago, the Ministry of Tourism in Israel uh, invited me and paid my way and my wife's way free to go to Israel. And um, I was like, are you kidding me? So I went. And while I was there, they wanted me to teach. And so I taught a couple of times. And they said, okay, you know, you're in. Yeah, we will always, uh, we'll hook you up with a, a travel agent. They will always pay your way as long as you bring uh, 18 to 20 people each trip and, you know, and teach. So I'm like, this is a this slam dunk. So every year, except last year, since then, I um, take 18 to 20 people. Last year we didn't go because we just didn't have enough people so they wouldn't pay my way. <laughs> So, um, so uh, when I go there, I just show you all these sites about where Jesus was. And uh, one of the guides told me, he said, I've, I've done this, you know, millions of times and heard hundreds of pastors, and I've never heard anyone teach as much as you do. He, he wasn't meaning I taught long because I don't in Israel. I just teach a lot because I'm always pointing out, see that? That's where Jesus was when he said, and I'll do a teaching on it. And see that? It, it just makes the Bible come alive and I'll take you to a vineyard and we'll see all this stuff. So come to the meeting next Sunday night. If you want to go to Israel, we're going to go the last day of October and the first week of November this year. It's, it's going to be amazing. And you'll get to see uh, some of the things that we, I keep talking about. So back here, John 15, the disciples didn't have anybody, didn't need anybody to show them the vineyard. They got it instantly. And they understood the staying connected to Jesus and after Jesus died and went to heaven, they looked back on this. So John wrote it all out because it was so meaningful to him. And if there was one chapter that you were going to just meditate on that was going to give you the most help, it might be this chapter right here. There's so much value here. And um, the question for me is how do I stay connected? How do disciples like you and me stay connected the way a vine stays connected, or I'm sorry, the way a branch stays connected to the vine? Because when Jesus says, I am the vine, and says to the disciples, you are the branch, he says, you know, my life, my spirit, my character will flow into you just like the life of the vine flows into the branch. And it won't be you trying to squeeze out little grapes and fruit in your life. It'll be you just abiding, remaining in the vine, and that fruit will automatically happen. When I read through this, did you notice that no place does Jesus say, command, bear fruit? He never tells them to bear fruit. He says, remain in me, abide in me, stay connected to me. And if you do that, then you will automatically bear fruit much fruit. So what's the secret to this staying connected that that Jesus is talking about? Well, look at verse 4, the first verse we read, when he says, remain in me as I remain in you. 
This is relational language. Remain in me as I am in This is not some transaction that happens. This is, this is dynamic. This is relationship. It's almost as if there's a conversation happening where Jesus is saying, this, is, this remaining in me and, and, and I remaining in you is this reciprocal relationship is happening where we're in this conversation together. Now you tell me, what's the word we use to describe having an, a conversational relationship with God. What's that word? Prayer. Exactly. So write that down. We stay connected to the vine, to Jesus, through prayer. And uh, as, soon as, I write that, as soon as you write that down, I want you to rem- think with me. This is not saying prayers, okay? <laughs> this is not some, you know, learn the prayers, and if you say the prayers, then you'll automatically be connected. No, we're talking about an ongoing dialogue, a relationship here. This is, the, this is the secret. Jesus is not introducing religion. He's not introducing rituals. He's not introducing, you know, um, uh, magic phrases that if you learn, you're, you're in. He's inviting us into an organic relationship that is pictured so well by the branch connected to the vine. So you stay connected to to the divine life of Jesus as you remain in him as you pray. He is divine, you are the branch. See how that works? And as you you connect with him, Peter talks about this, his, his divine life flows. There's so much um, available to you in prayer. So much life available to you in a learning, a, a, an ongoing dialogue through the day. Now, what, do I mean like at work? Yes. Imagine that Jesus is right with you. He is, but just not in the flesh. So you have to imagine. Him. And I'm not talking about an imaginary friend because he's real. It's just that you can't see him. And Go through the day with Jesus and include him in your decisions, in the things that confuse you, in the tasks that are given to you. Do life with Jesus. Keep an ongoing dialogue. Now, you gotta be careful about this because if you're moving your mouth and talking and you're by yourself, people might see you and think you're crazy. You know, it used to be that they thought that way when you were in the car, but now, since we've all got these, you know, cars that have microphones in them, people don't flip out anymore when they see you talking all by yourself. They think you're, you're talking to a microphone. But they might at work, so you might have to mumble on your breath, you know, but include Jesus in the course of your day. I know some of you are thinking, dude, my job is hard. I, 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 I can't include Jesus. Can I just say to you, It'd be the best thing you ever did. Jesus, let me just be real profound here. Jesus is smart. He knows more about your job than you do. I know you're like, what? It doesn't matter what you do. He's omniscient. He knows everything. There's nothing about your job that he doesn't already know. I know we don't think about Jesus like that. We think about Jesus, the religious guy. But Jesus is the smartest lawyer. He's the, he's the best mechanic. He's the best plumber, which we could hire him. I mean, he knows everything about everything. Invite him into your day. He's the best parent, the best friend, the best leader. Call on him. Enter into an ongoing dialogue with him. This is what I do. I just, I, I breathe these prayers out to Jesus. That's what my book is about, is this ongoing learning to breathe as I fill myself with the Spirit of God and breathe out my tox, the, the, you know, my sin and the toxins that keep me from talking to God and that keep me from understanding Him. And there's this ongoing dialogue. And um, sometimes we're funny together. You know, I'll ask God, you know, what do I do about this? And, and what do you think about this? And I just enter into this. And I talk to God throughout the day. Um, it's the first thing that I do in the morning is I, I get out of bed, I land on my knees, and I say, Lord, today I want to love you. I want to love people. I want to live surrendered. All day long, I want to stay in connection with you. So I'm starting the day off doing that connecting thing, and I just, I just keep it going. 
You know, I might jump in the shower. I might go downstairs and spend some more time with him. I might go for a run, but I'm getting things started by spending time with him and saying, I want to do this day with you. Now, the, uh, I know for sure, this happens to me all the time, I, I know that there are times when my best um, intentions of doing my day with Jesus get blown up. I get so busy, cr- life gets so crazy, things get so bizarre that I forget about Jesus and I get so focused on my tasks and I get to the end of the day and I'm like, oh man, I just left him out. Check this out. This is why fasting is so awesome because I can forget about Jesus during a busy, crazy day, but as soon as my stomach growls, man, it gets my attention. And all of a sudden, the, the, all I'm thinking about is I'm stinking hungry. And remember, we've been saying that this fast is a way of prompting us to, to, to talk to God. So fasting is a fantastic way to, <laughs> to interrupt your ignoring Jesus to remind you that just as your stomach is growling and you're dying for food, you then use that as a prompt to say, Lord, I'm hungry for you. I want to know you. Because remember, this whole fasting thing, this is not about you getting points with God. This is not about you being religious. This is not about you, you know, improving uh, yourself in God's eyes or in anybody else's eyes. This fast that we're doing as a church, and especially this next week, which is going to get tough, it's, a, it's, it's helping us to be attentive to God, to, to pay attention to his voice and to learn to hear from his voice. His voice. So this next week is going, to, is going to be a great time for him to interrupt your day to remind you of your need for him. And maybe that will help train you, Lord, I want to do, I want to do life with you. And, um, you know, the vine metaphor is not something where Jesus is using a metaphor of plugging in and then unplugging. That, that vine and that branch are connected 24-7, always connected. Um, now, as valuable as it is to have this ongoing dialogue, to do life with Jesus, there's also great strength in um, creating some scheduled uh, times. You see this with Jesus. In Mark 1.35, he taught, Jesus taught me this. In Mark 1.35, it says, very early in the morning, before anybody else got up, Jesus got up, and the first thing he did was he prayed, spent time with, with God. He models for us. Spend a regular time with God. Jesus would go to the prayers of, in, the, in the temple. So Jesus didn't abandon schedules and say, hey, I'm just living 24-7 with God. He used both. And so... Um, you know, I talked about getting out of bed, first thing I do. There's a, recently, I've started this whole wristband thing. Some of you wonder what this is all about. Recently, I, as in July, so I've only been doing this since July, on July 14th, we started this thing called seven, Pray 714, because July is the seventh month, you know, on July 14th. 714, I invited you to pray the seventh chapter of Second Chronicles, the 14th verse, which is a verse that cries out to God for our country, for revival, for ourselves. And at 7.14 a.m. or 7.14 p.m., I'm, I'm prompted by my wrist and by the clock to, to stop and pray for seven minutes and 14 seconds. No, I'm just kidding about the seven minutes part. Um, but at, on, we, on 714, we started praying Second Chronicles 714 at 714 in the morning or in the evening. You can pray as long as you want or just a couple seconds. But it's just a, it's a, it's a prompt. It's a regularly scheduled prompt so you don't forget about Jesus, so you can spend your day with him. Um, se- seven o'clock every morning, we have devotions as a family. And um, we... We go through this, this, uh, the church-wide devotions so that we're uh, being fed with the Word of God. So these are, these are just regularly scheduled examples of regularly scheduled times that I invite you to do so that you're staying connected to Jesus. Um, at least one time during the day, you need to include not only praying and talking to Jesus, but you need to include the, the next way of staying connected to Jesus. And it's in verse 
7, remember how I said we're going to just jump on some high points? Verse 7, Jesus says, if you remain in me, and then these words, and my words remain in you. In fact, this is, this is the second way of remaining in Jesus, is that he, we stay connected to him as his words remain in us. We stay connected to Jesus through the word. Every word that Jesus said is the word of God. We call the Bible the word of God. We talked about this last week. And this is a fantastic way of staying connected to Jesus. So at least once a day in your ongoing dialogue or your scheduled times with God, at least once a day, include scripture, include the word of God so that you're doing verse seven, so that his words are remaining in you. Um, Paul talks about this in Colossians 3.16 when he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word that Paul uses there, the word dwell, is a, is a synonym of the words in John 15 for the word of remain, remain in you, abide in you. Uh, it's just, and they're both of those, Colossians 3.16, the word dwell, and the word remain and abide in John 15 are both synonyms of the word in John 3.22 that says spend time with. Do you see the connection here? Spend, we spend time with Jesus as we remain in his word, his words abide in us, and we dwell, let his word dwell in us. There's something powerful and life-giving when you let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, remain in you. The, the picture there is of dwelling is to make its home in you. See, some of you, right now as I'm preaching, I'm preaching the word of God, and the word of God is, is looking for a place in your life to, to, to settle in. But you're not welcoming. John 5, 37, Jesus says to the religious people, my word has no place in you. It doesn't dwell in you. You hear my word. You search the scriptures to see what the truth is. But you're, you're hearing the word, but you're not letting it dwell in you. So you have to listen to the word and, and let it dwell in you. Let it, let, let, it, let it look into your life and find a place to live there. Let the word of God find a... Um, uh, a Teflon wall in your heart to hook up to, so you don't have a Teflon heart, uh, so you don't have a, I'm sorry, not Teflon, Velcro, Velcro heart, so you don't want a Teflon heart, so the Word of God just slides in and slides out, you want a Velcro heart, so the Word of God sticks and finds its home in you and abides there, dwells there, remains in you, and by doing that, you stay connected to the vine, you bear much fruit, you become more like Christ. You say, well, man, how do, I, how do I let the word of Christ dwell in me? Well, a long time ago, I think 10 years ago, I started this process of writing out some church-wide devotions for you. And I keep talking about this, but let me spend a couple seconds explaining this for, for those of you who are new or have never done this. Every day in your email box or your phone, on the Twitter feed, on our website, or a hard copy, you can read some scriptures that we've uh, carved out for a daily reading. So the word of God is dwelling in you. And uh, as you read through our plan, you'll read through the whole New Testament and you'll read through the Psalms every year. The whole New Testament and the Psalms. So on a daily basis, you're reading the word of God and you're reading it slowly. You're letting it sink in, letting it dwell in you. And as you read it, we invite you to meditate on it. And so every week, I'm sorry, every day, we pull a meditation verse out of that reading and invite you to meditate on that verse, to, to dwell in it, to, last week we talked about pondering it, um, picturing it, letting it marinate in you, you know, letting it percolate. So you're thinking about that and wrestling with it. So you read the Word of God. You, you meditate on it. And then, after you meditate on this verse for a while, then you, 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 there's a verse every week, a meditation verse every day, and a memory verse every week 
that we invite you to memorize, and you review it every day. So this past week, the memory verse was um, Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus is talking to a bunch of people on what we call the Sermon on the Mount. I'll take you there, that very place in Israel. It's amazing. And we'll hear him preach and teach. It's awesome. And in this sermon, he, he says, you know, you're, you're so concerned about what you wear and your food you eat, and you're so concerned about all these things. Instead, seek God first. He'll take care of all this stuff. And as you memorize Matthew 6, all week long, it just it finds its home in you. And it begins to shape your prayers. It begins to shape your desires, and you become more like Christ. So the last thing, after you read the Scripture, meditate on a verse, memorize, and then review that, then you pray the Scripture. And every, every day there's a prayer written out for you based upon those, those verses, especially that meditation verse. I so urge you to do this. This is a daily process. And, and as you're reading the Word and meditating on it and memorizing and praying it, do these, these three things I call the triple A's where you ask questions about the text. You bombard the text with questions. Lord, as I read this, what is, it, what is it saying? You ask God, show me what this means. You ask questions of the text. Who, what, where, why, when, how. All these questions you're engaging as you're reading. This is how the, the word of God dwells in you richly. This is how you remain. This is how the words of God remain in you. As you ask questions, you interact, you engage. Then you start thinking and analyzing what you're reading and you're wrestling with it, you're pondering it. And as you analyze and think about it, you're asking, what does this mean? In ask, you're asking, what does it say? In analyze, you're asking, what does this mean? And then you begin to apply it. Ask, analyze, apply. I wrote this years ago. I, I do this every time I read the Bible. It's secondhand. I want to invite you into this. Make it second nature that every time you read the Bible, you're asking, what's going on here? Why this word? Why did he say that? What's, what's happening here? Who, what, where, why? Analyze, think about it. And then apply it to your life. Because if you just hear the word, but don't do the word, it's of no value to you. You've got to apply it to your life. And this is how the words of Christ Verse 7, remain in you. Does this make sense? They abide in you. They, they stick in you. And you find yourself becoming more and more like Christ. You begin to pray the prayers that the Holy Spirit fills you with. You begin to think the thoughts that God wants you to think. You begin to value what He values. And you begin to become more and more like Christ as the word of Christ dwells in you, remains in you, abides in you, and begins to shape your heart. Okay, let's, let's keep going. So down in verse 9, Jesus says, The Father has loved me. Find verse 9 there. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Well, how, how do I do that, Jesus? Next verse, verse 10. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. He, he commands them, remain in my love. We, we say, how do you do that? He says, keep my commands. What's he saying? He's saying, obey me. So write this down. The third way we stay connected to Jesus is through obedience. Now, friends, I can't stress to you how important this one is. Don't pass by this one. Some of you are branches withering on the vine because you've stopped obeying God. I guess that was God underlining what I was saying. Um, It's not my stomach growling. (laughs) Okay. Um, uh, Obedience is absolutely essential if we're going to stay connected to the vine. You're going to lose your sense of fellowship with Christ if you stop obeying Him. You're going to lose that sense of 
his hand of blessing. You're, gonna, you're not going to be able to hear from God if you're disobeying him. Sometimes people will say to me, I want God to give me more light. I want him to, to give me more direction. And I'll probe and I'll, you know, I'll discover they're not obeying the words he's already giving them. And God won't give you more truth. He won't give you more light to walk in if you're disobeying the truth he's already given you. He won't give you more direction until you begin to obey what he's already challenged you, called you to do. So obedience is really, really important. And so you say, well, why? Let me give you three really quick reasons from from John 14 and 15. First of all, this idea of um, remaining in in, uh, the love of God. And Jesus says, the way that you remain in my love is by obeying my commands. So what happens is that obedience deepens the love relationship that we're having with Jesus. The sense of his love, the, 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 the sense of his work in our life, in fact, it grows our heart of love. When you obey Jesus, you find that you love him more because Jesus is not a hard taskmaster. He is inviting you into abundant life, but you're so afraid of obeying him that you, you step back, but when you obey, you find that this love just deepens and um, it gets, the, the intimacy gets more real. You sense the love of God growing in your heart. Go back one chapter to chapter 14, verse 21. Same night, same disciples, same Jesus. And he says, verse 21 of John 14, whoever has my commands, by the way, I'm not putting this on the screen because I realize that some of you aren't bringing your Bibles. So I'm, I, th- I think I'm training you not to bring your Bibles. So it's not up there. You're going to have to bring your Bibles. It, it'll be a good thing. Um, Whoever has my commands, verse 14, 21, and keeps them is the one who loves me. Oh, we just, we just heard this. We, we get this, Jesus. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I, will, and, the, and, um, and I too will love them, and I love this last phrase, and show myself to them. The idea here is to reveal more of who I am. I'll show myself. And see, revelation showing, revealing more of who he is. Revelation is always an invitation to intimacy. Revelation is always an invitation to intimacy. So that's why there's this love language here. Jesus is saying, if you obey me, I'll reveal more of myself. I'll show more of who I am to you. In other words, obedience opens insight into who Jesus is. This revelation gives us insight. Oh, that's what you mean. Oh, that's who you are. We get to know Jesus better, our insight into who he is, our insight into what he means, what his words mean. They get gets clearer when we obey. Likewise, it gets less clear. It gets more muddy when we're living in disobedience. Obedience opens insight. And then back to John 15. (laughs) Um, Look at the very next verse after verse 10. That should be a verse 11. Verse 11, he says, I have told you this. What? Remain in my love. Keep my commands. I've told you this so that, I've got that uh, underlined in my Bible, so that my joy may be in you. The joy of the Lord may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Obedience brings joy. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what it's like when you obey God and a joy fills you. A joy unlike the happiness that comes from circumstances. This is a joy that's so much deeper. This is a the love of Christ inside of you that brings this joy. This is the the presence of the Holy Spirit breathed into you, bringing you a level of joy that surpasses whatever kind of difficulties you're going through. This is the joy of the Lord that becomes your strength. So there's three quick things that happen in our life when we obey God, but the biggest thing is obedience helps us stay connected 
to the life of Christ flowing into us, just like prayer, just like the word, now obedience. Now there's one last thing. And I finished with verse 12. I'm sorry, I finished with verse 11, that your joy may be complete. Look at the very next verse. He's talking about commands that I want you to obey. Well, what is the command, Jesus? Verse 12, my command is this, love. Not just love God, love each other. And here's the measurement, as I have loved you. The fourth way that we stay connected to Jesus is through loving others. Through loving others. You say, wait a minute. You said we were being connected to Jesus. How, do we, how does loving people connect us to Jesus? Here's how. There's actually a couple ways. Remember, remember in Ma- the end of Matthew where Jesus uses this parable and says, you know, uh, some of you will come to me and, uh, and say, you know, when I... Um, I, you know, I clothed the naked, I fed the, fed the hungry, I went to invite those who were in prison. And Jesus said, when you did it to those who were, to the least of these, to those who were naked, you clothed them. To those who were hungry, you fed them. To those who were in prison, you, you went and visited them. When you did that to them, you were doing it to me. <laughs> Leslie, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lady in our church that does this so well. Leslie, when you are doing this, you are loving Jesus. When you love the people of Jesus, you're loving Jesus. He's so connected that, that he receives that as you feeding him, loving him, clothing him, visiting him. See the connection there? Jesus wants to live connected to us. So when we love his people, when we love people, we're loving Jesus. The guy that wrote John wrote a couple letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, at the end of your Bible. And in 1st John 4, 21, he talks about how if we say we love God, then we should love our brother. They they go together. And so we say at our church, we're going to love God and, tell me, love people. I love the message translation of 1st John 4, 21. Loving God includes loving people. You can't separate them. The first part of the Ten Commandments, loving God. Second part of the Ten Commandments, loving people. Part of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name, loving God. Other part of the prayer, loving people. Forgive us our sins and help us to forgive those who sin against us, loving people. Loving God and loving people is all over the Bible. Why? Because it's, they go together. And when you love people, it's a way of staying connected to Jesus. Here's the other way this works. Is um, when we love people, verse 12, as... Christ loved us. So it's not just, you know, being patronizing and saying nice things. No, it's, it's loving as Christ. That's verse 12. As Christ loved us. When we do that, friends, that's hard. I ask people all the time, when I ask God all the time, what does it mean to love well here? Because that's how God is going to measure our life. Later on, Jesus said, by this, everyone will know you're my disciples. By your love, by your love. So we're measured by our love. I don't want to measure my love against you because I may love better than you or I may love worse than you. You may love better than me or not. It doesn't matter. We want to compare ourselves to Jesus. That's the measurement. And when I compare the way I love, the way Jesus loves, I realize I don't love well. I need his power flowing in me. I need to get back connected to the vine so that his love is flowing through me. You don't want me to love you with my love. My love is not enough. I'm self-centered, I'm selfish. I'm, I think about myself way too much. Um, You want me to love you with God's love. This is the way we're to love one another. And so, have you discovered that when you try to love like this, it's stinking hard? Because people are messy, and it's just easier to love somebody else. And haven't you done this? Haven't you started to love somebody and just got too hard, and you just said, forget that, I'm going to love these people. They're a lot easier to love. And then they they got hard to love. And it's like, where can I find the easy people to love? That's why we watch television. That's why we do pornography. That's why we play on the Internet, because... It's so much easier 
to love objects and flickering screens who don't demand anything of us. Loving people is hard. It's messy. And it drives us. It forces us to go back to Jesus, to go back to the Holy Spirit, to fill us, to go back to God and say, God, I, I got to live connected because I can't live, I can't love my wife as Christ loved the church unless it's your love flowing in me. I can't love the people that I've been called to be the senior pastor of unless it's your love. I can't love my children. I can't love my staff. I can't love my neighbor. I can't love anybody well. I need your love. It drives me. It forces me back to connection. It forces me back to the vine. It forces me back to breathing in his love. So it's a, it's a blessing to seek to love those that are hard to love because it, it actually ends up making me more like Christ. Because instead of fooling myself into thinking I've loved you well by saying a few patronizing words, I dive into that relationship and I fail <laughs> and I get grace and I go out and I love again. And, and in that process of God's grace filling me, I'm becoming more like Christ. In the process of me crying out for the Holy Spirit to fill me, I'm actually becoming more like Christ. In fact, <laughs> staying connected to Jesus is the only way that you and I can be like Christ. That's why this is so important. And that's why I've stumbled through this message today. Because I, I want so badly, let's, let's pray together. Lord, I want so badly, you know my heart. I want so badly for us to get this. I, I want us to learn to live the, the vine life, the Christ-like life, not by working hard, but by remaining in the vine. And Lord, it does take effort to pray, to be in the Word, to love people, to, to obey you. It does take effort. But that effort is not us trying to become like Christ. That effort is us saying no to our selfish desires and saying yes to you. Saying no to the lie that I can do this myself and saying yes to your spirit. And so Holy Spirit, come now and fall afresh on us. Even as I'm praying, come and fall upon us. Holy Spirit, you're the one that, that brings the life of the vine to flow into us. Jesus, you said that the spirit gives life. My words are life. So Spirit of God, flow into us, fall afresh on us. Teach us to pray, keep us connected, open the word to us, call us to obedience, open our eyes to the people who need to be loved, and work your power in us. Make us more like Jesus and teach us how to abide, remain, live connected in the vine. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.